Right. I think people are coming in. Um, good, uh, good evening, um, everyone, and welcome to uh, this uh, joint event between the Society of Labour Lawyers and CIRA on um, trade policy and the environment uh, broadly. Um, we're very lucky to be joined today by three uh, great uh, speakers. Um, first of all, Ruth uh, Cadbury, MP, who's Shadow uh, Trade Spokesman and MP for Brentwood, Brentwood and uh, I Brentwood and Isleworth. Brent, right. Brentford, Brentford and Isleworth. Um, <laughs> my excuse is I've got COVID at the moment. So no it's common to give, to give the odd slip. Yeah. Brentford and Isleworth. Um, uh, uh, and our other two speakers are uh, Sam Lowe, who anybody who follows trade policy matters on uh, Twitter or indeed um, the Financial Times uh, will, will know about. Uh, he does a very valuable um, weekly newsletter um, full of insights and uh, the odd sort of quirky thing about trade policy. Um, and Katrina uh, Walter, um, who is a lawyer at the at WWF, the World Wildlife Fund, um, who and, and the WWF uh, is, is probably a leader in thinking about uh, eco uh, environmental policy and trade policy uh, and trying to get them to match up. So without more ado, um, Ruth, would you like to start off, kick, kick off by saying a few words? Yes, certainly. So for those who don't know me, um, I was elected in 2015, one of the few um, new Labour MPs elected in 2015, sorry. Mm. And my seat um, is uh, for Dan West, which is one of the two Hounslow constituencies in West London, very mixed, very diverse in all sense of the word constituency, but strongly voting remains. So my majority went up quite a lot between 2015 and 2017. Um, I've uh, I've been on the housing and local government teams and then in the reshuffle in November, I think it was, I was um, uh, shifted over to the trade team, which um, I was a bit sort of nervous about because I thought, I don't know anything about trade. I don't have a business background, but actually, particularly in terms of the, what I would say called the values stuff of, of, of which... Um, environment policy is very much part of that. Um, I realise, you know, I do know more than I thought I did. Um, so our, our Shadow Secretary of State is Nick Thomas-Simons, and the other two members of the team are Gareth Thomas, who was in the trade team before with Emily Thornbury, and Nia Griffiths um, uh, as well. So um, that's the Labour trade team. Um, and very much for inviting uh, me to speak, um, obviously to esteemed organisations, um, uh, long-standing affiliates to the party. Uh, I'm not eligible to be a member of the Society of Labour Lawyers, not being a lawyer. Um, I have been and should be a member of CIRA and probably I'm not because I probably haven't paid my sub for a while. I'll, and check, I'll check the records. <laughs> yeah, and do, chase me for it because I apologize because you know as I say emotionally um politically I, I I should be a member um so yes trade and um being used to tackle the climate emergency and as I say there's a more expert um speakers here today on both trade and, and climate and environment uh, issues and law um you you wanted the front bench line so this is what you're gonna get um, uh, you know, uh, and also I'm happy to take away questions and issues we should be raising if we're not already. So, um, you know, it goes without saying the urgency to uh, act, tackle the climate crisis. Uh, we all know the impact that the climate uh, crisis is, is having around the world and particularly on the most marginalised uh, communities. And um, I think for all of us uh, who signed up to today uh, and, and for myself, um, you know, it's just, and, and most of my colleagues, um, uh, many of us who popped up to Glasgow for COP26 for, for a while and, and, and so on, you know, it is so frustrating to see the huge climate shaped hole in, in the centre of the government's trade policy, but in fact, in so many policies. Um, we've seen such a disconnect between their words on climate change and their actions. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's as stark as ever when it comes to trade policy. Um, and sometimes this dis 
disconnect becomes just simple hypocrisy. Uh, approving a new coal mine mere months before COP26 or reopening fracking licenses after talking about the dangers of fossil fuel. Um, and the disconnect and the hypocrisy comes out when, when you do look um, at, at the Department um, uh, for Trade and also in terms of Department for Trade, it, it applies to other values led uh, policies um, such as human rights, modern day slavery, such as um, animal welfare, consumer standards, um, and so on. Anyway, back to uh, environment and climate. Um, last year, the Board of Trade published a 52 page report, um, and the Board of Trade advises uh, on trade policy. Um, as Emily Thornbury um, said, you know, it, that was seven pages of pictures and only two actual recommendations. And, you know, it's just another example where, you know, the government publishing reports and, and ministers, ministers to give uh, grandiose speeches in nice locations and declare their commitment. But of course, it's what it's the actions that matter and the, and the policies. Um, so one example, and I'm sure Sam will bring many more, um, is the Australia deal. Um, first, probably really significant free trade agreement uh, deal since, since Brexit. So, you know, let's, let's trust, I mean, appointing Tony Abbott to our Board of Trade, uh, first of all, Tony Abbott, who's called climate change a periphery issue, and then negotiating a free trade agreement, um, stripping out the key clauses around the climate crisis. And Australia, as we know, one of the worst climate polluters among the OECD countries and has an awful record on the environment. And this could have been a chance for the UK to use its long term relationship with Australia and our leverage to put clear environmental commitments in, in a deal. But they passed on the chance and uh, we now know that in leaked emails. Uh, that show that they ditched the climate pledges, uh, pledges in a frantic race to get the deal over the line, um, uh, despite uh, the promises that the Prime Minister gave to Greenpeace that they wouldn't uh, do that. Um, uh, and, you know, but then why should we be shocked that this Prime Minister was being um, a little bit economical with the truth? Um, I think let's go back a step and look at the context of UK trade policy. Now, um, when we were members of the EU, trade was done by the EU. We didn't do trade, we uh, trade policy, trade negotiations, because that in a sense was steered to, through, through our membership of the bloc. So they had to invent a trade, you know, they had to create a trade department, trade ministers and trade policy. So that could have been the time to actually consider where they wanted to uh, diverge from EU policy and go stronger on values led policies as they applied to trade. But um, friend, we, we, we're pushing them all the time on their trade policy, but it seems to be little more than this um, uh, desire to, to negotiate um, trade, free trade agreements quickly in order to be able to say, uh, according to their manifesto commitment, that 80% uh, of UK trade um, is uh, delivered within a free trade agreement. And, you know, let's, that means getting FTAs out the door, signed, sealed and delivered quickly. The fact that the trade agreements that we're talking about, um, you know, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and so on, even Japan, you know, tiny percentages of economic benefit to the UK, and, and of course, nowhere near matching the loss of trade that we're now seeing as a result of, of leaving the EU. It's it's not just the sort of that, that hole in sort of what's the economic policy, um, but um, uh, not using it to promote uh, a, a variety of values-based policies, but, you know, they're giving away ground to our defensive interests. So in terms of agricultural tariffs, you know, the farming, lobby, the farming community, they're an important sector in this country. Um, they're given away um, on that in a way that no other country would be prepared to do. And, and they're setting precedents, which is then going to impact um, other future uh, trade deals and, and, and other future potential trademark partners are going to, see, going to want to exploit that, that gap. And then with the exception of digital, they're not taking the time to shape the deals to support our existing 
export strengths such as financial services or professional services or open new markets for our fast growing new exports and green technology is um, an area that UK manufacturing is strong on. So, um, you know, so we're, we're kind of um, scrabbling around, uh, you know, finding policies to we don't have any. Um, uh, just in terms of parliamentary context, there is a select committee on international trade. They're currently doing an inquiry on trade and climate change. And there's also an all party parliamentary group, which is um, say a cross party informal group, but registered with parliament. Uh, it's an APPG for trade and export promotion. And the chairs are Lord Waverley and Gary Sambrook. And they're uh, in the process of completing a report on aligning trade rules to meet climate and environment goals. The thing that's most notable to me, uh, and uh, you know, I was in, in the chamber when the Australia deal was being discussed, is um, the, the, U, the UK government has no interest in scrutiny. There's a complete lack of transparency, uh, a lack of accountability to parliament, and a lack of a willingness to bring a trade deal back to parliament and to, be, to allow parliament to go through it in detail. Um, but also um, we've got issues that the NGOs and the sector, uh, the, se the sector bodies are also feeling left out. And I happened to be on a parliamentary visit to South Africa um, a couple of weeks ago, and we met the chair of the Trade and Business Committee, uh, and we were mainly talking process. And, uh, you know, it was really noticeable how much more parliamentary and NGO scrutiny uh, they, the, 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 they have in South Africa um, over trade deals than, than we have here. And it, it, it kind of, it was, it just showed, it just kind of brought home to me that, that gap. Um, I also want to say that, you know, trade is not just about free trade agreements. Um, uh, the government seems to want to prioritize trade agreements and um there's, there's an awful lot not happening in terms of current trade um uh export support uh, and so on so your question what what would we do differently so um you know we've been very clear that we would put our values and our beliefs at the center of trade and trade policy uh we know that trade can be a positive and powerful tool uh, across the world, but it needs to have the right safeguards and protections in place, and particularly around climate. Uh, we've been clear that the UK should sign up to the New Zealand-led agreement on climate change, trade and sustainability. Um, it's not only the right thing to do for the UK, but it also sends a powerful message um, out uh, to, to, to other partners and potential partners in the world in general. Um, and it's interesting to know that there are some Conservatives who support us as well. We've warned about the risks that investor state dispute settlements in trade deals pose. Um, they harm efforts to move away from polluting forms of energy like coal, but they can also lead to regulatory chill where governments um, are afraid of clearing up their power sources as they know they could get sued. Now, I mean, the whole issue about ASDS is, is quite nuanced and I'm not gonna kind of, declare a, a black and white policy on, on that, and certainly not tonight. Um, we've also been clear that we do not see, as I say, sufficient parliamentary scrutiny and engagement with civil society. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we want to work with civil, civic society and civil society, whether it's the NFU or Greenpeace or because it's all the farmers or so on, because trade can't happen in a vacuum. Um, and, in terms of using trade policy to tackle the climate emergency, we can only do so if we reevaluate and refocus our view of trade. It's not something that should be used to make ministers look good. It, it, it isn't something that should be done in a rush to reach an artificial target as this government has done. And it's not something that should be done in isolation. And the only way we're gonna tackle the climate crisis if it runs throughout our trade policy, but of course, not only our trade policy throughout all government policies, you know, trade policy should complement our other policies and our values should be running through all of our policies. So I hope that's useful. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, Sam. So thank you 
very much. And sorry, I had to drop off uh, very briefly. Thank you very much for having me. This is a topic I quite like discussing because whilst I sort of opine on trade policy more widely, I suppose my roots in trade policy were uh, in the environmental side of the discussion, uh, given I ran the trade policy work at Friends of the Earth for a few years um, before sort of broadening uh, my scope. I also wrote a paper recently with George Riddell of Ernst & Young um, on, uh, create, on how you could go about creating a UK uh, green trade strategy, which, which I described less of a paper, more of a list, uh, but, 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 but hopefully useful nonetheless. When, 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 when discussing these issues, I tend to put and asking the question of what the UK could do or, or even what any country could do, I tend to put the different components into three buckets. So I ask first, what could the UK do unilaterally on trade and the environment? What could it do in a bilateral context? So for example, in the context of a free trade agreement, and then what could it do at the plurilateral or multilateral sphere? And if we, if we start with the unilateral space, this is where the UK has the most autonomy in a sense, it can decide to do something without having to discuss with others, although we should take into account that there are still some constraints, for example, in the trade policy space, the need to implement measures that aren't that are non discriminatory so that apply equally to domestic producers and uh, producers based elsewhere but under that heading you have measures such as a carbon border adjustment mechanism or a border carbon tax you can describe it uh, as you like the environmental audit committee published a paper on this uh, just earlier the, this week um, advocating for the uk to adopt such a measure which would see a carbon levy or charge uh, equivalent to that imposed upon domestic producers uh, in, uh, applied to imports into the United Kingdom with the idea being that it both guards against potential carbon leakage, so the offshoring of polluting and heavy industry, and also ensures that you have a level playing field at home so that domestic producers are not um, losing out uh, to, 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 to polluting competition based elsewhere. And then you also have other things you can do unilaterally product standards being one, this is much easier if you're applying it to a final standard than it is to how you go about producing things. However, in the production space, it is possible, for example, for the UK to act unilaterally to mandate that all food produce or, or animal produce sold into the UK has to have been created in a way that minimised the use of antibiotics or the like. So something you can justify for a very good reason that isn't just pure discrimination is, is something you can do unilaterally here. And then you also have measures around supply chain due diligence. So for example, under the Environment Act, the government and DEFRA are currently consulting on deforestation measures, which would, could, if they thought, goes the same way as the EU's proposal on this, require importers from countries that are prone to illegal deforestation or deforestation in general, uh, and uh, for those imports to be subject to third party certification or similar to ensure that it's not being sourced from uh, illegal plantations or the like. And then also on the unilateral side, you've got tariff removal. If you want to remove tariffs on environmental goods, you can just do so. And to, to be fair to this government, it has done that for the most part uh, with some peaks remaining. In terms of what the UK could do bilaterally, you have joint commitments so as i say these are sort of aspirations or, or 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 reaffirming commitments to existing treaties so you see this in the context of say uk new zealand where both parties have committed to uphold their obligations under the paris agreement but in the context of uk new zealand they also make specific uh, temperature reduction targets something that wasn't in uk australia slightly controversially um, but you can also in the context of bilateral agreements insert conditionality so you could you could conceivably say that tariff reduction or removal is contingent on a foreign supplier abiding by a certain set of rules or production standards. And really, there is no limit on what you can do here in terms of the conditionality. The limit is solely what the other party is willing to sign up to. And I'll get on to that slightly near the end because there's some because it, it comes an issue that I think 
uh, my discussions with this have largely been in the EU context historically because that's where trade policy competence lay but obviously we're having those discussions in the UK now but it's something that left-wing parties do struggle with in the conditionality debate and I'll get on to that in terms of broader you have the plurilateral and multilateral agreements um, Ruth has already mentioned uh, what, one of the most forward-thinking plurilaterals in the context of uh, the agreement on climate change trade and sustainability which is headed up by new zealand which has commitments to reduce fossil fuel subsidies having commitments on environmental goods and and also on other discussions you learn in the wto context have very slow moving discussions in, in the environment space that i'm not convinced they're going to get anywhere anytime soon but they do exist so so it's just to wrap this all together in terms of what can the uk do in terms of what it legally can do quite a lot I think. I mean, in the unilateral space, you often get into discussions of, well, can you, do you, can you actually require imported food to have been produced to UK farming methods? And the answer is, it depends. What's your reason for wanting them to do that? Do you actually have a really good environmental, animal welfare, public health reason, justification for that? Or are you just trying to protect your own farmers? And of course, that line is not always clear. That is a that can be a very blurry line, but you can do it so long as your arguments are good and your reasoning is good. You shouldn't just be wanting to keep out foreign producers just for the sake of it. But you can if you if you're trying to ensure that everyone's um, sort of abiding by rules that contribute to, for example, public health in the form of targeting antimicrobial resistance. I think you're probably starting in a strong place, um, but there is a question of leverage and this and this is where I sometimes run into difficulties when having these discussions because you often find that actually what people want is just not to trade with other countries or just to make to protect domestic producers which is a legitimate thing to want to do that's if public policy isn't all trade you have lots of other reasons for why you do things as a government it is legitimate even if I might disagree with you or someone else might disagree with you, it is legitimate to retain tariff protection for certain producers because, just because you want to <laughs> or because you feel that, you know, it would be unfair to expose them to global competition. Like you can make that case. The problem you have is that the moment you want to restrict market access and for in the context of a free trade agreement are not willing to liberalise, for example, access to the UK's agri-food market, it becomes much more difficult to impose conditionality because people are essentially through that conditionality paying for access to your market. So if you said, and let's frame this more positively, I think the UK could have imposed more conditionality on the Australians. We offered up a huge amount of market access to our agriculture, to our agri-food market. We've committed to remove tariffs on nearly everything other than long grain milled rice, poultry, pork and eggs. And we've given it for free. And that's a legitimate thing to do, but the UK could have said, if you want access on these terms to our market, we are going to require that you abide by some specific rules. And these could have been some of the things that the farmers are worried about. And would it have taken longer to negotiate the agreement? Yes. Might Australia have signed up to it? Also, yes, because the offer on the table was so generous. They want access to the UK market. It's a question of what they're willing to pay for it. The problem is, though, if you are not willing to give that market access, because in a sense, then the conditionality, the, the, the trade and environment discussion becomes moot because you're never going to have the trade agreement. Even in the unilateral sense, if you impose controls to the point that no one actually bothers selling to your market, then you have not um, had any impact on what happens outside your borders. So from a carbon border adjustment mechanism, you have not... Um, inspired other people to change their approaches and that trade-off is the thing that I think is difficult for Labour in particular because you can use trade policy as leverage to deliver other goals and that's a, something you can do it's perfectly legitimate and it's perfectly possible however your leverage increases the more willing you are to offer more access to the UK market the, uh, the more generous you are the more willing you are to liberalise and that bit of the equation sometimes comes into conflict with other objectives. And I'll pause there. All right, thank, thank you very much, Sam. Um, just before quick tip, before I hand over to uh, Kat, I'll just say about questions. If, you've, if you think of any brilliant questions, um, do uh, put them in the chat. 
Um, if you want just to direct them at me because you'd rather remain anonymous, that's fine. Or you can direct them at everybody. Or we can just use the old hash, old fashioned way at the end and people can put their, um, I think, virtual hands up because it's quite difficult for me to see real hands, but I do see the virtual hands. Um, OK, so having said that, I hand over to Kat. Thanks, George. Um, and, and thanks very much um, to the Society of Labour Lawyers and Sierra for organising this event. Um, I think we can all agree it's a really um, important topic for us to be discussing and it's great to hear from Ruth and from Sam on it. Um, I'll try and um, also comment on a couple of things they've said as, as I go. Um, so as uh, George said, I'm a lawyer in the advocacy and campaigns team um, at WWF UK. Um, where our overarching goals are to tackle climate change, restore and protect threatened habitats and species, um, and also to fix the food system. So in policy terms, um, trade, as I'm sure you can all appreciate, is a key cross-cutting area, um, both in terms of the opportunities and risks um, for climate and nature, now that the UK is outside of the EU and negotiating its own trade deals for the first time in some 50 years. Um, but also, uh, trade deals have significant consequences for the environment in the UK and around the world um, by reducing barriers um, on the exchange of goods and services, some of which can cause environmental harm, um, and others of which may actually improve the sharing of technologies that can help us to tackle things like climate change. Unfortunately, um, without additional new safeguards, um, and, and I would um, completely echo what, what Ruth was saying earlier, the UK's current trade agenda really risks causing more environmental harm than good. Um, so there are lots of ways that um, we think the next Labour government could really turn this around. And again, this kind of includes a lot of the things that we've already been talking about. So um, having an explicit published trade policy or strategy um, and also increasing um, scrutiny and consultation for trade agreements. And I would completely agree with what Ruth was saying that the Board of Trade Green Trade Report isn't specific enough to be a trade policy. Um, it also comes from an advisory body, so it's not technically published um, government policy. And the government can't be held to account um, for it. Um, I'd also agree that these uh, the deals that we've seen so far set quite a worrying precedent for future deals. Um, so if you look at the Australia deal, zero tariff, zero quota access, um, as Sam was saying, for you know, all of our agri-food products um, without any kind of environmental conditionality being set. Um, but I'd say the key area I'd like to focus on this evening um, from a WWF perspective is the need for core environmental standards to really address um, environmental leakage effects in the global agri-food trade. And again, this is something that, um, that Sam has already touched on. So, Although the current government has taken forward some useful individual initiatives, such as the Green 100 tariff reduction, liberalising trade in green goods and services, um, this helps to support positive efforts from producers of sustainable products, as Dan was saying, um, but it doesn't prevent environmental harm caused by producers of the most unsustainable products. And by that, I'm referring to goods which are sourced from deforested land, um, unsustainable water abstraction, um, or which use harmful pesticides and chemicals in their production. To address this, um, we would say the next Labour government should introduce core environmental standards. And um, so that would be to ensure that agri-food products which are imported into the UK are subject to the same minimum um, product and production standards as those which are produced domestically. Uh, so in simple terms, um, there isn't any point in ensuring that we minimize environmental impacts of the food we produce here at home while importing products from overseas with a substantial environmental footprint. Um, what we don't want is for our domestic production standards to be undercut by imported products which are produced at a lower environmental standard. Um, but equally, we need to prevent international trade um, from leading to a race to the bottom in standards whereby we find ourselves here um, seeking to lower our own standards in order to compete with imports. Um, so to tackle this, uh, we need to set a baseline um, of environmental criteria for how agricultural products allowed into the UK market are produced. And this really needs to go above and beyond sanitary and phytosanitary standards. Um, poor standards, and, and again, kind of touching on what Sam was saying, this could take the form of domestic legislation um, requiring agri-food imports sold in the UK to meet comparable standards to those we require of our own farmers. 
the introduction of core standards would help ensure that um, asymmetric agricultural production standards for food traded around the world doesn't become a barrier to free and fair trade as some countries raise ambition on issues like climate, biodiversity, um, antimicrobial resistance, etc. Looking at that in a bit more detail, um, WWF has commissioned a report by a panel of um, international trade law ex experts to explore the best way that we can design um, core environmental standards. And they focused on the introduction of measures um, which are unilateral, going back again to what Sam was saying, national um, and mandatory. Um, and the key takeaways from that report are that we need to ensure core standards are designed in a way that, that you know, they don't discriminate between like products. Um, and by that, I'm referring to um, the term used in, in, uh, in the WHO rules, um, that they have a legitimate regulatory objective, and they're based on science, um, we tackle the extraterritorial reality issue by um, finding, you know, having ensuring that there is a sufficient nexus between the legitimate regulatory objective and the UK, um, and that we apply even-handedness so that we have sufficient flexibility to take into account um, the relevant conditions and characteristics in the exporting countries. Um, and finally, we need to ensure that it isn't more trade restrictive than necessary to achieve um, that regulatory objective. Um, I realise this is probably quite techy for any, anyone on the call who isn't um, a WTO lawyer, um, so we're going to go into too much more technical detail here. Um, but if you are interested to know more, please do get in touch. Um, and our report on core standards is due to be published um, in early May. So I will leave it there for now, and I'll pass back to Doris. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Sam is just about to enlighten us on a clause that most free trade agreements have, so we're, wait, we're waiting for bated breath for that. Um, uh, Sorry, I was, but then I forgot that for some reason <laughs> all of the all right. recent PDFs of, of, of UK free trade agreements are impossible to copy and paste from. And I, Fine. Have, no, and I have no idea why they've done that, but it's very easy, annoying. But they all have termination clauses, usually for the sort of six month or three month or 12 month uh, period. Um, well, there's no, no hands up. A good question has come from Dave Merrick, which I'll ask you in a second. But before we get to that, just a question of mine. Um, I mean, what do you think the environmental implications are, the, the implications for environmental trade policy are, if by 2024 we have managed to join the CPTPP? I don't know, Sam, I don't know if you want any views or cat. I mean, my sort of view is, <laughs> I don't know if this is controversial, but nothing. I, I, I just, I mean, as, 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 in, as in, I think you can use free trade agreements largely to bind commitments that countries already want to make. But in essence, I don't really see from looking at CPTPP why it would prevent or worsen the UK's environmental agenda. I think the problem with all of these things is largely domestic, as in, does your domestic government want to be ambitious on the environment or not? That's the that's the first order question. And if they don't, then you know, they won't. But if they do, then I don't see why CPTPP would make it more difficult. I suppose the one question in CPTPP that does feed over into the environment space slightly is when it comes to investor state dispute settlement in that I have a new, I have a fairly nuanced view on investor state dispute settlement, but broadly speaking, I don't think it's necessary in terms of something that, uh, it, it, for those who don't know, it allows foreign investors to bring cases against a government in the event of uh, indirect or direct expropriation or, or, or lack of fair and equitable treatment in some instances. And it, the UK has carved this out of its agreements with Australia and New Zealand. It will do so again in the context of CPTPP, but it probably will apply in some instances. So there's then the question as to whether the fear of a foreign investor bringing cases could impact on a country's willingness to pursue its net zero agenda, which could in some instances require either direct expropriation or the introduction of regulatory measures that could be deemed to um, be classified as indirect expropriation. And possibly, uh, 
I don't think it would actually stop the government like the UK doing whatever it wants, but I think it is notable that in the context of the Energy Charter Treaty, a treaty the UK has signed up to, that a number of countries are trying to carve out fossil fuels from its coverage and the investor state dispute settlement coverage within it because of this exact fear. I would say that you can also find cases that have been brought against government for phasing out renewable subsidies. So it's, it's not clear cut, but I, th I think there is a, an argument there. In terms of the other environment provisions, I would just state, because this does get missed, that UK, Australia, UK, New Zealand and, and CPTPP have enforceable commitments on environment, as in the environment commitments are subject to the state to state dispute settlement provisions and could theoretic a breach could theoretically lead to the removal of preferences. That's something that's not true of EU trade agreements and is a progression in UK trade policy uh, in a direction that many environmentalists have been calling for for a while. Although um, I think because people are generally upset about lots of other things the government are doing, I'm not keen to point out in this instance. Very, uh, th thanks, Sam. I mean, I, I, Kat, um, Ruth, any quick comments on that, or should we, uh, we're happy to move on? I... Yeah, I, I think I, I think I would agree with Sam. It really depends on what what side agreements are negotiated and carve outs and things, and whether there are there are any ISDS provisions. Um, but I would also just say that um, we'd worry about some of the products um, from some of the sort of unsustainable production of those countries that would be involved. So things like um, you know. Palm oil is a classic example. So, um, yeah, I, I think my answer would be it depends, um, but I would largely echo what Sam has said. Right. So, um, um, Dave Merritt asked a question on the chat about how easy it will be to amend the more egregious aspects of the current government's um, trade uh, deals um, uh, when uh, Labour gets in. I mean, that's a sort of combination, I suppose, of a legal question and a policy question. Um, I mean, the, the legal question in a sense is, um, I think all, pretty well all of these agreements are terminable on a year's notice. Um, but of course, you've got to decide whether you want to want just to pull out of them um, or whether you want to try and re renegotiate something better and then re renegotiating something better ceases so really to be a legal question becomes more of a, um, you know, just a question of politics. Um, so Sam, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that or Ruth. Please let Ruth come in. Yeah. Well, I was going to. I was actually saying I'm kind of Sam goes first because I'm interested in the legal answer to that question. <laughs> okay. So, so, so the legal answer is is what George said. Although actually, it can be less than twelve months. Right. So, in terms of so, so just I'll just read out from UK Australia. A party may terminate this agreement by giving the other party notice in writing. Such termination should take effect six months after That's the date of notification. Right or on such date as the parties may agree. The time changes. In some agreements, you'll find it's longer. Uh, so 12 months is quite common uh, uh, as well. And But then as to whether you can renegotiate the agreements, it's a political question, really. It's leverage. You know, the, Trump managed to renegotiate NAFTA. <laughs> uh, so, so if you threaten to pull out, in a sense, you probably do trigger a renegotiation um, as, part of the, as part of the leverage. So... As with lots of international law, it's not what's written down matters, but it's also um, politics is very important too. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, as a junior shadow minister, I'm not going to um, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to write a policy uh, in, in an event like this, and I, I think that's right. I think um, you know. Uh, it would depend on on our policies. Obviously, it would depend on our leverage and our relationship with the the um, the other uh, nation or, or block. Um, you know what would be achieved most for the UK, but also what would be achieved. What would uh, where where is the biggest gap in in terms of in, in the case of uh, this discussion in in terms of the climate crisis and and you know what. What is there most to gain um, uh, and most to deliver? So, um, yeah, I, I, I would imagine that um, judging by, well, depending how many uh, trade agreements that the government's finally signed, um, I would imagine we'd be wanting to review them and, and consider them on a case by case basis. I would, you know, certainly everything we've said about the Australia deal would be saying, well, you know, that's it's obviously not doing 
uh, our farmers any any good um, or potentially. I mean, uh, you know, this is, it's quite clear that the, the NFU um, have have re are really really concerned um, about the impact on UK farmers and then uh, in terms of our, uh, food standards as well. So that presumably would give some leverage to be able to look at the other aspects that we're not happy about. But you know, I'm not. You know, I'm not going to commit to that. Um, yeah. All right. Um, uh, Joseph Callan's got his hand up. So, um, Joe, what's if you'd like to? Uh, I don't know whether you can mute yourself. Oh, you can. There we are. I, yeah. Uh, I, thanks. Um, so, talking about some of the sort of more measures that we could potentially bring in, I, I'm very much aware that the EU has currently got the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is going through right now. But there's been a lot of controversy about whether that would pass through another dispute panel system, which we haven't really discussed that much, which is the WTO. And I guess I've got two sides to this question, um, because the WTO dispute mechanism has been kind of jettisoned for a while. The appellate courts have been out of option for, for a long time. Uh, first, your question to Sam. Do you think that the WTO panel itself and the current rules and the GATT regime, would that potentially cause an issue with some of the environmental um, measures that you've been suggesting? And from that, is there a reform of the WTO which is actually needed? And further, Ruth, if you wouldn't mind if I could ask you, has there been any discussion within the Labour Party on the current stance over the WTO dispute settlement mechanism, uh, whether you'd want to reform it or whether you want it to be restarted? I'll let Sam go first. So, so, so do I think a number of EU measures might be challenged by others uh, the WTO, yes, so on the carbon border adjustment mechanism. I wouldn't be surprised if the supply chain due diligence rules uh, in respect of uh, deforestation were challenged as well, because they do seem to explicitly target a certain a few countries. You can imagine uh, who they are, and they do look slightly discriminatory in terms of how they've been structured. But the question I always get to is, who cares? As in, as as in, as in will does a challenge will a challenge stop the eu from doing these things and also what would it be the result of the eu losing a challenge because it's we don't know for certain whether it would lose in the first instance the eu has tried to design its carbon border adjustment mechanism in a way that it believes is compliant with the wto rule book lots of other countries will disagree but then if the eu does lose and this is assuming that it goes through a process in which you have the dispute and then there is an appeals function which does exist there's an alternative that's been created in the absence of the wto appellate body sitting what's the consequence in all likelihood it just will require the eu to tweak it it'll have to change it somehow this is what happened in the past when the eu has lost cases or to give another example if the eu has lost a case it will just ignore it and it will continue to implement the carbon border adjustment mechanism anyway, which is what it's done in the event of in, in, in the hormone beef case, right? Where actually it's lost that case, continues to apply restrictions. It's given some countries a sort of quota for non-hormone beef to try and buy them off, but it's not going to change its rules. So, 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 so my, this is why I bring the so what question. This is also why I'm not a lawyer. If you had, if you had a WTO lawyer here, they might phrase this differently, but, but it doesn't matter. It's, the EU is big enough to do whatever it wants if it really, really wants to do so. And in the case of the carbon border adjustment mechanism, it will. It will try and obey the rules, it will tweak it, but, but, it, but it doesn't really care um, beyond that. And in terms of reform, I'm also quite cyn cynical in terms of the possibility of reform of a lot of these things. The WTO will be reformed when the US and China want it to be and not before. And it doesn't really matter what the UK thinks, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, so... Um, you were asked about Labour's view on yeah, the body I mean, problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I would imagine that... So I'm not saying, you know, have we discussed this? Um, no, I haven't discussed it. I don't... Um, uh, you know, um, it's a kind of... You know, I wish I'd like to, I wish we were, you know, I wish I could say, yes, we've got all this detail sorted on all, all of this, but um, the reality is we haven't, we, you know, top level, um, we're getting quite a top level policy issue um, uh, at this point. But um, my sense is, is that 
um, if the EU had strong and positive environment policies on trade, we would probably, if we, if we were in government, we'd probably want to work within that context and within, within that sort of policy environment. Um, I don't know whether that's a, a reason, you know, and that answer makes sense um, in in terms of trade policy, but it um, it's not really a lot I can add to that. To see quickly yeah. the detailed briefing sheet, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Right, uh, so other questions uh, we've uh, got. Um, a, a couple of questions sent to me about relation, particularly about relationship with the EU, um, which we haven't sort of looked at in any uh, great detail. Um, I mean, one issue of which, Sam, which arises from what Sam was talking about, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, is, is to what extent a future UK government, obviously not the current one, uh, might want to link up to the EU arrangements on the emissions trading scheme and so on, because the EU CBAM already, as formulated, is going to extend to the EEA countries and I think others, um, I hope it's Switzerland. Yeah. Um, I mean, whether there might be any, what the policy advantages or disadvantages to the UK might be of that. So, I mean, but perhaps that. That that's sort of one, one perhaps a fairly important aspect of relationship to the EU. So uh, let's start with that. What are what are your views on on that issue, um, Sam or Cat or Ruth? I'll leave it to Sam and Cat. For Cat to go, I've spoken a lot. Thanks. Um, yeah. So on on carbon border adjustment mechanisms. Um, I'd say they're, they're potentially very useful mechanism, obviously, for ensuring carbon taxes drive low carbon production of energy intensive goods. Um, but, but it's much more complicated to measure the embedded greenhouse gas emissions from agricultural products. Um, so things like beef, corn, avocados, that's much harder than trying to measure it for things like steel, aluminium, ammonia. Mm -hmm. um, and the introduction of CBAMs could also lead to quite perverse incentives for highly industrialised agriculture. So you might find yourself in a situation where you're actually encouraging things like low welfare, livestock, and obviously that, that has huge risks for nature, including things like antimicrobial resistance or, you know, zoonotic diseases and things like that. Um, and it, it really doesn't, I don't see how that mechanism could capture kind of the broader range of environmental impacts um, of farming effectively. So again, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, thinking about issues like water pollution, um, air pollution, habitat destruction, and things like that. So um, while, while I think there are positives of introducing them, I'm not sure it necessarily um, solves all the issues that we're talking about. Well, it explicitly doesn't solve that issue, right? In that, in that it's not going to be extended to agri-foods anytime soon, largely because there is no domestic carbon price applied uh, to, to, to agricultural production either the eu or the uk in which to benchmark against i mean you can't and, and from a discrimination point of view you can't really justify applying um sort of a carbon levy to imports if you don't even uh, sort of apply a carbon uh, tax or or, or or equivalent to your domestic producers in terms of, in terms of the uk's relationship with the european union cbam I mean, it's something that the government doesn't want to deal with, but is going to have to, in that the UK is one of the countries most exposed to the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism, just in terms of trade flows. You know, the most exposed countries, it's probably not anymore because of, because of, because of, because of the sanctions. We're talking Russia, we're talking China, talking the UK. You know, that's, and, that, and, and that makes sense if you think about how integrated we are within the European market. And, but it's a complicated one because... In terms of how it will impact UK exports of, say, steel, aluminium, cement to the European Union, I would not expect there to be an additional charge for those products to pay because the importer in the EU can take into account the carbon price paid within the UK and that carbon price is going to be similar to the EU's, if not higher. But what you do create is a bureaucratic border. You would create additional admin 
for companies in the EU buying from the United from the United Kingdom, and you provide an additional incentive for them to stop. There's been a lot of incentives for companies in the EU to stop buying from the UK recently because of Brexit, and this would just be another one because they'd have to go through this whole new process. But the UK government could avoid this. If the UK linked its emissions trading system to the EU's, it would be exempt from the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism. This is true in the EA countries and Switzerland already, as George said, and it's written into the proposal. The UK doesn't currently want to do that, and I have no real idea why. It seems all of, you know, I speak largely to industry on these things nowadays, and they all want to link it up. It just makes everyone's life easier. UK government doesn't. I, but it's interesting that it's one of the few areas of the trade and cooperation agreement where future convergence is actively discussed. In mm. that ev everything else is about divergence, but it sets it aside and says, well, we'll talk about this later. We might link it up. But there's another issue with the EU's carbon border adjustment. Well, two more. One is the EU introducing a carbon border adjustment mechanism will, to, in, to my mind, possibly bounce the UK into one because you have an issue, you have a the possibility that high carbon intensive exports of say Turkish cement that would have previously gone to the EU might find their way onto the UK market instead and then that will lead to domestic pressure from the UK cement industry for a, maybe a partial carbon border adjustment mechanism to protect them. and it sort of spirals out of control that way so the UK should get ahead of this discussion now and start thinking about how it wants to design it whether it wants to mirror the EU whether it wants to do it slightly differently but it's not but it, well, it's having those discussions quietly but not very but not in a, in a public sense the other issue is Northern Ireland in that the carbon border adjustment mechanism is Northern Ireland protocol relevant this has been confirmed in discussions between the EU and the UK it was initially con confirmed in the EU's proposal but it got wiped out of an early draft uh, so as not to cause too much uh, distress but there is then the question of whether goods entering Northern Ireland from Great Britain will have to be subject to the bureaucracy of the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism, or alternatively, it could apply for, for, for goods exiting Northern Ireland and going into the rest of the EU, but then that creates land border discussions. And then you have other discussions about how it applies to goods entering from elsewhere. This is something that linking the emissions trading system would not fully solve. You'd still have to discuss what the EU, the UK does for goods arriving from elsewhere, but would reduce this problem greatly. But as I said, the UK government is not quite there yet, but it is of course something a, a future Labour government could possibly want to, to, to have on its agenda. Ruth, have you got any thoughts on that? that no, I mean, uh, it's, not, it's a one of a whole list of issues where, I mean, Emily wrote 238 questions to um, the Secretary of State, and I don't think we had many answers, and uh, that was before the, the reshuffle, and we continue to push them um, for answers to questions um, uh, on these, um, and uh, I just think, you know, we've... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, and they just, they keep, you know, we're pushing them for questions um, uh, and answers. The other issue that um, Nick in particular has been really strong on is, is the, is the protect, the need to protect the UK steel industry, obviously being from South Wales, that that's important. And that may um, not be helpful in terms of what Sam was saying at the beginning about how does a, a, a a left to centre government um, <clears throat> both have an open um, and values led trade policy while also protecting um, uh, UK jobs and so on. But, um, uh, you know, it, 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 knowing that uh, the carbon border mechanism has an impact on, on our steel uh, and um, production is, is um, you know, it's, it, you know, do, do, does influence that. But, um, yeah, it's more us pushing them. And again, like as you say, uh, what is your policy? Why why isn't there a policy? So the, the, those questions have been we have been raising those questions. I mean, we only get one set of trade one um, ministerial session on trade questions every six weeks. Um, so we get to ask <coughs> uh, or uh, between, around fifteen questions or supplementary questions. So. Um, and then covering all of trade policy in that time. There's not really been scope in the current parliamentary um, timetable, and especially with 
everything that else has been happening, um, COVID, Afghanistan, Ukraine, etc. Uh, and the big bills the government's trying to push through, the really controversial ones like nationality and borders bill, the health and care bill and so on. You know, trade doesn't get much of a look in in parliamentary time. Um, so there's a, not a lot, um, you know, we've not, uh, um, uh, in a sense, sorry, this is a bit of a roundup from me, but um, in terms of what's Labour line. Um, so uh, knowing what the Labour line is since Emily, uh, Emily did some big piece of work, but that's, you know, getting on time-wise. Nick is due to be doing a speech probably between Easter and the uh, and the summer recess. So I hope we'll have a lot better, uh, 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 a lot more detailed answers to the questions you're raising, and also many other uh, NGOs and uh, are, are asking us on our on our policies. Um, and, but I we really value the questions, so um, I'm trying to grab the questions you're asking today. But please do. Uh, write to me as well with issues that you think we should be resolving and um, uh, and having a line on. I'm not saying we will do it, you know, we can't please all of the people all of the time, um, but it's really useful having the expertise uh, that, um, that uh, uh, you know, you, you bring, um, uh, you know, but obviously both, you know, um, Pat and Sam, um, but also, I know you wouldn't be at this event today if you didn't have quite a lot of knowledge, uh, as well as obviously an interest in, in trade and, and the environment and, and the, the climate crisis. Yeah. That was one way out. That was a good way of getting out of it, answering <laughs> the detailed question, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's obvious, the, there's always a bit of thinking to be done about what um, what, what Labour decides to do on, on this sort of issue when renegotiating the Trading Cooperation Agreement, which is going to be an issue of all reviewing it, which is going to be an issue in 2025. Um, yeah. And that sounds like it, it probably is one of the issues that needs to be looked at um, uh, pretty carefully and thought about in that um, context. Um, I don't know if there's any more um, questions um, in, in chat or uh, hands up. Um, no, I'm one, I think one question it's a more gen a general question about the importance of, of the scrutiny and transparency in trade policy. Obviously, that goes much wider than just environmental uh, concerns. Um, Kat, I, th I mean, you, you mentioned this as a, as a possibility. I mean, are there any particular um, uh, in, so, so sort of forms of scrutiny that you think would be really helpful for the next Labour government to, to institute uh, for, tr for trade agreements, negotiation of trade agreements? Yeah, thanks, George. Yeah, I think I think that's a really important point. And it's one that Ruth touched on in her kind of opening as well. Um, I think, I mean, it, it's quite concerning that there's no guaranteed debate or vote um, during, you know, following the current the current sort of process. Just basically following the Crag process. It's not in its subject to the parliamentary timetable. Um, if we compare that to the process in the US. US Congress or EU Parliament, they both have to approve the final um, trade agreement before it can be ratified. Um, I think mirroring something closer to that would be um, preferential because obviously that means they're actually they're better involved at all stages during the negotiations um, and they have access to the classified negotiating text. Um, there's been several parliamentary committees, including the ITC and the IAC, that have really been calling um, the current government out on the inadequate scrutiny process um, that we've seen for the Australia and New Zealand trade deals. Um, so yeah, I think I think the next Labour government could introduce enhanced parliamentary scrutiny um, in the UK. Um, I also think um, we touched briefly on um, consultation. Um, I think it's fair to say that with trade agreements having a very significant impact on the environment, um, as we've been discussing this evening. Um, I do think they would be considered environmental legislation for the purposes of the Aarhus Convention, which means they should be subject to those public participation requirements. Um, and I also think that just having consultation before negotiating objectives simply isn't good enough. Um, and I think there should be more ways um, for the public to be involved during the process. Um, of negotiations. Um, Sam, I don't know if you've got any thoughts having sort of have come from background at FOE and now a slightly different perspective and any sort of additional thoughts on that issue? 
On well, the issue of parliamentary scrutiny. Yeah, well, well, scrutiny more generally. I mean, made by Parliament and and other, you know, pu public more widely. So, 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 so my view is that the current UK approach to, is inadequate. Uh, it just solely in so far as, as as I find it perplexing that MPs don't get to say yes or no. And of course, scrutiny scrutiny goes much deeper than whether you can say yes or no. But mm -hmm. it feels it, it feels it feels like quite a low hurdle to clear. And when you just compare that to other countries, other than countries whose systems have been heavily influenced by the UK <laughs> uh, for the most part, but who you think about, you know, in the EU, but also in the US, democratically elected politicians get to say yes or no. Yeah, and, and and for me, whilst acknowledging there's more to it than that, um, I, I I think that I, th I think that should be the case. In terms of wider scrutiny, I mean, it is difficult, in that most lots of what's in a trade agreement. I mean, I, I accept they're often fourteen hundred words or so, but it requires someone like me to tell you that about twelve hundred of them are boilerplate, and uh, uh, so, so actually knowing where to focus, what matters and what doesn't. Is, is quite difficult and I'm not convinced our parliamentary system is equipped to deal very well with it. I mean, just speaking from personal experience in terms of, so I think I've given evidence on all of the new trade agreements to both, to both houses. Scrutiny in the Lords tends to be a lot more in depth than in the Commons. And some of that is, and some of this is just to do with the breadth um, of, of, of subject that the, the MPs are sort of expected to be on top of. But, but even in the context of specific committees where people have worked on it for a while, um, it doesn't feel as if understanding has set in uh, just yet, if I'm being slightly... I'm not trying to be rude, I'm just... Yeah. No, I mean, my take on it is that uh, you know, we... I, I wonder if in an equivalent economy, um, there could be a, a nation that is worst uh, equipped to for parliamentary um, scrutiny, but also the involvement of NGOs, NGOs and, and and trade groups. I mean, I, I think you know we have, and I guess other experts have concerns even about the competency of the department itself. But I mean, the the kind of you know when you're talking about complex matters that really impact on uh, people's jobs, people's livelihoods, maybe even whole sectors. Um, the, the the lack of the lack of uh, um, resources put in and the time and lack of time put into scrutiny all part of this policy to rush through um, you know eighty percent of, of of our trade being um, uh, under an FTA which in itself is a bit of a meaningless target but I mean the the one if amusing if it wasn't so depressing one that came up is that. Um, so uh, Chris Elmore, who, who's um, South Wales MP with quite a lot of sheep farmers, um, uh, asked the question on behalf of the NFU because the farmers themselves haven't been able to get this kiss, fairly critical answer out of um, the uh, Trade Department. Um, I can't remember whether it was the Australia or the New Zealand deal that, that, was, that we're talking about, but I think we're talking about sheep and, and, and the uh, so um, as you know we're talking about meat sorry so they, the, the NFU struggled to get answers to basic questions particularly whether the meat export weight in the deal was based on on the bone or off the bone and Chris Elmore having once been a butcher kind of knew that there's quite a difference because bone does weigh quite a lot so um, and the NFU couldn't get an answer out of the Trade Department as to whether they were negotiating weights of meat based on on the bone or off the bone. It's like, yeah, if farmers would tell you that and the average civil servant might not know it, but had they spent enough time and resources on working with the people in those affected sectors, they might learn a bit and then have to think that one through. You're muted, George. Right, I am, right. I was just sort of looking at the uh, time. We've sort of gone over our um, hour. I don't know if there are any other um, uh, burning or not so burning questions that people uh, have. Um, 
I, I don't know whether any of the panelists would like there's, there's some insight that they haven't had the opportunity to share that would just like to just throw in that the this is not a question demands the answer yes but just in case there's any points I have that, I have one because I, I, I forgot to mention it earlier but my view is that the UK New Zealand free trade agreement is the pinnacle of what the UK is ever going to achieve in the context of its bilateral free trade agreements. Just when you take into account the context under which it was negotiated and the government in New Zealand. And that might please you or it might concern you, but I do think it's true. So it's something to consider. <laughs> Did you say the New Zealand? Yes, trade New Zealand. Yeah. I mean, presumably that's a product, I mean, A, of having a, a government a counterparty that's pretty keen on environmental policy, certainly wants to and, and Exactly, and the UK negotiating it uh, in the context of its COP presidency. And, yeah. and, 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 and you could potentially tweak it a little bit, but in terms of ambition, it's there. And I, and I imagine lots of environmentalists looking at it are still disappointed. So that, that's, why, that's why I sort of put it out there as a challenge. That's um, uh, interesting and slightly, well, might be cheering, but probably depressing, I suspect. Um, uh, but anyway, so um, I think on that um, slightly minor keynote, um, I, I sort of bring, bring this to an end. Um, thank you very much to all our uh, three speakers, to, to Ruth for giving up her time to come and uh, talk to us this evening. And um, Kat and Sam for their you know, exp enormous expertise and insights in this area. Um, it's been a very interesting discussion. I've learned a number of things. I hope other people have as well. Um, and um, what on Zoom is I can't ask people to sort of clap, but sort of pretend you're clapping as a sort of round of thanks. Um, and that, that, uh, uh, yes, there are. Some people are taking advantage of being on screen to clap. Uh, so thanks everybody. Um, I think Ruth has just put up her address, um, which uh, I assume Ruth is because you're, you know, if anybody on this call has any particular points they want to bring to your attention, that's an invitation for them to do so. I hope you know what you're letting yourself in for. Well, we're all comrades in, in the Labour movement, I think, so. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> no, I look, I look forward to hearing uh, from people, particularly people who know a lot more than me about what we've been talking about and I hope to catch up with Sam and uh, Kat before too long. Yeah, and certainly from the from wearing my hat as uh, from the Society of uh, Labour Lawyers, um, uh, I mean, Ruth, certainly um, you and the, the team should feel free to, um, to, to sort of approach us whenever you feel that some legal issue that you need a bit of um, help with. Um, we're already doing something um, for Nick that he suggested we do. Um, but uh, you know, if there's anything else that you you'd like some assistance with, um, either either sort of more long-term projects or just immediate issues that you suddenly throw it up that you need to deal with, uh, and of course thinking about Labour's policy as we're thinking about getting towards the manifesto and writing that, and what's Labour going to say about trade okay. policy and what what are sensible yeah. things to say that actually work legally? I mean, again, we're very interested in that. Would be really helpful. Thank you, George. Yeah. And and I guess that that holds across trade policy, not not just yes, yeah, yeah, indeed, and, and and with relationships with the EU as well, which I'm not sure to what extent you're covering. Um, I'm not entirely sure where that's gone within government, but uh, you know, I think it's sensibly looked at as a whole. That's why we well, Nick, Nick is actually chair. I think Nick chairs the sub group of the um, shadow cabinet on on EU in, and, and yeah. EU policy and Brexit policy, sorry, yeah. and post Brexit policy. Great. Uh, well, Great. the sort of Great. discussion we had about CBAM sort of shows how it gets thrown up in even in, you know, so it's, it's all part of wider trade policy now, whether one thinks what everyone's views on leave remain, that's where our relationship with the EU now is. Um, Great. Uh, thanks, everybody. And um, uh, 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 good evening to, to everybody. I'll bring it to an end there. Or Frankie, are you, are, do you bring it to an end? Um, yeah, no worries. Anyway, I can close it. Everyone can yeah. sort of log off now. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs>